Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How do United Nations programs that were created to eliminate the scourge of war, promote economic and social development, and enhance human rights impact people not only in the United States but around the world? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at the United Nations and some of the programs that it has and take a look at the United Nations from really the founding in 1945. My guest today is an expert on the United Nations. My guest today is Steve Schlesinger. Steve Schlesinger is a fellow at the Century Foundation in New York City. He is the former director of the World Policy Institute at the New School University in New York. Mr. Schlesinger authored Act of Creation, Founding of the United Nations. Steve Schlesinger, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate you being with me, Steve. Let's flash back to 1945. World War II was just about coming to an end. We saw where 60 million people died, the horrific Holocaust, 6 million. How did, how did all of that play into the creation of the United Nations, basically under the leadership of President Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and a few other key leaders? Well, you're quite right. The devastation of the Second World War was the lynch point, uh, the, the trigger for this remarkable organization. I mean, you have to remember that 25 years earlier, there had been the First World War in which 30 million people had died. So two wars within that period, 90 million people were erased from this planet. And the, the delegations that came to San Francisco were absolutely desperate for something, some large organization some international security body that could prevent aggression in the future. So this was really the reason for, for uh, San Francisco and for the United Nations. People just couldn't bear the idea that there would be a third world war. Mm -hmm. Now, the prior to that though, the forerunner of the UN was the League of Nations. It was set up what, about 1919, something like that. What role, what was that organization? What role did it play and why did it fail? Well, that also had been an American idea under President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and he, he was very idealistic. He felt that the damages that had resulted from the First World War had to be cured in some way, that the world community had to come together to prevent an outbreak of a Second World War. He felt the only way you could do it was to bring all of the different countries around uh, the earth to, to a central body that would agree that they would stop the outbreak of any conflict in the future. Unfortunately, the rest of the world loved the idea. The U.S. Senate and our country did not love the idea and defeated it. Mm -hmm. The treaty was defeated and, and the U.S. never joined the League of Nations. And as a result, from the very beginning, the League was rendered sort of ineffectual without the, one of the great uh, powers involved in it. And so it never was able to prevent uh, the outbreak of another war, as Woodrow Wilson had feared, so uh, he, it, the League was a precursor to the to the United Nations. It, it made possible the idea that this could actually be a viable instrument, and it ended up being the reason for a replacement, the, namely the UN. Yeah. In the opening, I mentioned that you had written the book, Act of Creation, Founding of the United Nations. And this historical evolution is absolutely fascinating from the time of the League of the Nations to, to 1945. And the, some of the challenges in creating this international organization, because we saw the, what the tragedy of World War II produced. What, what were some of the major obstacles? Obviously, even though the five victors from World War II were the ones who created the United Nations, they were not totally in agreement on every issue. What were some of the obstacles that almost derailed setting up the UN? Well, actually, the five victors, as you point out, who were behind the uh, sponsorship of the organization, it is true there were disagreements, particularly between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, 
uh, the Soviet Union wanted a kind of, uh, as you remember, the five countries had the veto power on the Security Council. Security Council was really the centerpiece of, of, the, of the UN because it, that is the one possible, that's the one unit that makes the decision on war and peace issues for the organization. Mm -hmm. And there was only 11 states that were uh, admitted to the Security Council, which five had the veto, and the other six were only on there for two-year terms. And the fives that had the veto was with Great Britain, France, China, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And there was a question of how big a veto that should be allowed. The Soviet Union wanted an absolute veto. The U.S. wanted a more limited veto, which would allow something like a crisis to be brought before the, the Council. But they had this conflict that went on the entire three months of the conference in San Francisco. And it was only finally settled when uh, President, then President Truman sent an emissary over to meet with Stalin, and Stalin finally backed off and agreed to have a more limited veto. But that was probably the biggest issue that confronted the uh, organization in San Francisco. But there were many other issues about whether there should be regional organizations within the charter, whether Latin America should have a, its own subset of a, of a regional organization, and that would be true of Europe and Asia and so on. That was finally agreed upon. But at the one point, the Latin countries threatened to walk out of the conference. So there were a series of subsidiary issues that c could have made the conference stumble. And it was really only, I think, the brilliance of the American delegation led by the Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, that kept the, everything on track and, and it was able to bring everybody together in the end. Now, you mentioned the Security Council. Of the six organs of the UN, that is the most powerful in that it has a responsibility for peace and security. And, it's, of course, there are 15 members now, 10 rotating, serving two-year terms, five permanent members who have the veto and are able to veto any resolution that comes before the body if one or two or more decide to do that. But we've seen during the Cold War, we fought the Cold War at this in the Security Council. The Soviet Union took its allies, went one way. The U.S. took its allies, went the other day, or the other way, and kept vetoing one another, um, and not much got accomplished. But since the late 80s, there's really been a, a really more of an air of cooperation rather than confrontation in the Security Council, but there's still challenges. They don't agree on everything. We saw that they did agree on Libya a couple of years ago, but now on the Syrian situation, there has been considerable disagreement on how to handle that particular situation. I know what we say today will probably be totally irrelevant by the time this program airs, but in general terms, how do you view this Syrian situation and what could be the role of the Security Council and what could be the role of the United Nations? The UN is involved in Syria right now on the ground in particular with UN agencies, High Commission for Refugees, UN Children's Fund, various others. But what could the, the Security Council do differently and maybe what could the UN system do to provide assistance to, the, uh, to defuse this, uh, this horrific devastation going on in Syria? Well, I think, the, uh, just to step back, it is true that in 1989, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, suddenly the uh, Security Council began to play the role that it, the original vision of the Founding Fathers had for it, which is namely to bring together under the rubric of collective security a group of, a group of world, worldwide nations to stop aggression anywhere around on the planet. So since 1989, there has been a great deal of cooperation in, in regards of, of preventing firestorms from uh, afflicting countries in, in every region of the world. Now, in, in the issue of Syria, uh, basically, the one breakdown that, that still ha happens in the Security Council is that of those five countries that have the veto power, any one of them can veto any action by the Security Council. And as we've seen in Syria, Russians and the Chinese have been adamant against ha having any UN intervention in the Syrian conflict, despite all the efforts by the West, particularly led by the United States, mm -hmm to try to work out a deal or at least make some kind of political settlement out of a devastating and, and really horrific uh, mayhem in, in that country. The, the latest idea, which is maybe that the U.S. will not bomb Syria in order to get rid of the chemical weapon depots, which has been the uh, issue for the last few weeks in, in this country,
uh, is this Russian proposal that we should work out an international arrangement so that all the chemical weapons in Syria will be under an international authority. Well, who is the international authority? It's the United Nations. It's, it's the Atomic Energy Commission that will be uh, looking into those uh, depots. And so it is true that the UN has been precluded from being involved in the, in the Syrian conflict, but it could curiously turn out to be, paradoxically, the UN, which actually brings some, kind of, some sort of peaceful settlement to the issue of chemical weapons within Syria. It doesn't mean that the war will necessarily end, mm -hmm. but at least that part of the devastation will be reduced. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you have a website where our viewers can go to get more information about what we're talking about today, maybe to get more information on your book? I'd be delighted to give you that. It's www.stephenslussinger.com. Okay, and these issues are very broad, and there are a lot of websites out there. One that our viewers can go to is www.un.org and get more information on what the Security Council is doing, the General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, a Trusteeship Council all across the board, all of the six organs of the UN and peacekeeping and a lot of other issues. This, the situation with the United Nations and the chemical weapons, this seems like a very logical approach and it seems like a role that only the UN can uniquely fill. No one else in the, in the world could probably be trusted to do this. Now, of course, any of these types of arrangements have to have, they have to be verified. You have to make sure the people are not cheating and that type of thing. But it seems like the UN is the only one that could be the sort of the neutral arbiter or the one who doesn't have a vested interest in, in trying to make sure that one side prevails over another. Well, actually, that is the classic role for the United Nations, to be the new, neutral arbiter. I mean, it's one of the reasons why any time a crisis breaks out anywhere around the planet, where, where do people go? They go to the United Nations. Uh, now, obviously, we know the, 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 the UN has its own internal flaws. That there's, it's never been able to solve every uh, conflict that is pre presented to it. But by and large, it has tried use, using diplomatic means, sometimes military means, but surely uh, collective means to, to bring peace to uh, otherwise uh, conflicts could spin out of control. And so from that point of view, uh, you know, the UN plays an incredibly valuable role. It's kind of like a, a fire station, you know. You don't hear very much about the fire station until a fire actually breaks out and everybody rushes to the station to get the equipment to stamp out the, the conflagration. That's the role the UN plays when there is a time of crisis. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. Today, we're taking a look at the United Nations, an organization that was created in 1945 to help eliminate the scourge of war, to promote economic and social development, and also to enhance human rights. My guest today is an expert on the UN. My guest today is Mr. Steve Schlesinger. Mr. Steve Schlesinger is a fellow at the Century Foundation in New York City. He also authored a book, a very informative book, on the UN called Act of Creation, Founding of the United Nations. Steve, we're talking about the role of the United Nations. We looked at the, the, the situation in Syria. Let's flash back to 2003 and look at the situation that ha took place in Iraq. We saw that there was a mobilization uh, by the United States in particular, by the Bush administration, to put together some type of a coalition to go into Iraq with the now bogus claim, and back then too bogus claim, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, that he was a threat to the United States. We saw that the UN system was ignored. Hans Blix, who headed up the verification mission for the UN, was totally ignored. He put out his report, the media covered it for one day and walked away from it after that. He was right, he was right on target, but they ignored it. What, are there any lessons that we've learned from this Iraqi adventure of starting an, an unnecessary and widely viewed illegal war that's killed over 4,000 Americans, killed over probably 200,000 Iraqis, and cost taxpayers in the U.S. over a trillion dollars. Have we learned anything from Iraq that would tie into how we view what's going on in Syria or some other trouble spot around the world? Well, I think the, the lessons of Iraq are that, in fact, the United Nations Security Council was right in, in wanting to veto any action in Iraq. It turned out the Iraq war was a disaster, not only for the world, but for the United States. And it's a disaster today, 10 years later. Um, 
I think what it, what it proves is that, you know, basically the United States, which was the creator behind the, the, this organization, the, 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 the single, single-minded in its pursuit of a international security body, should pay heed to this great gift that it gave to the world and make sure that it tries to conform to the obligations that it signed when it agreed to the treaty and joining the, the organization and, and heed the uh, complaints uh, and, and cautions of other states who say, you know, slow down. This is not necessarily a good idea to, to go into a country unilaterally without the backing of, of the world. And, and from that point of view, uh, even though the UN is not perfectly situated, it can't enforce a, an edict over the United States and say, we're going to punish you for circumventing us. It does have a moral authority that nobody can disown. And the moral authority is such that even after the U.S. went into Iraq on its own, without any approval from, from the Security Council, in the end, it had to go back to the U.N. to get some sort of support for its occupation of Iraq. And eventually the UN granted it that, that authority. But why did it go back? Because it realized it was totally isolated in what it had done in, in Iraq. And it recognized the need that if you're going to do anything on an international scale, particularly when it's re regarding military operations, you've got to have the backing of the world. And the only way you're going to get that backing is through the Security Council, which gives you the imprimatur of the United Nations, the one uh, organization that has been ratified by 193 countries and has been agreed upon as, as the sole legal authority for these kind of operations. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the UN has problems, no doubt about it. Anytime you bring 193 governments together, it, you're going to have unique challenges because there's no other entity in the world that has done that. The, the UN's the only one of its type. But as Madeleine Albright once said, the former Secretary of State said, the UN, even with this imperfection, I'm loosely quoting it, still is indispensable. And if we didn't have it today, we'd have to create it tomorrow. But what can be done to make the UN more effective and more efficient? I know that Ban Ki-moon has, has internal reforms, external reforms. Kofi Annan, former Secretary General, have, he brought a two-track approach to improving the United Nations. Are there suggestions where the UN can be more effective in the future? The biggest debate that went on in San Francisco in 1945 among the 50 or so nations that, that gathered there was over who should be on the Security Council. In the end, as we know, five countries were given the veto power and the rest of the world was left out. Ever since then, the debate has been over, should we expand the Security Council? And today, quite rightly, a lot of nations feel that power realities have changed in the year 2013 from what they were in 1945. In 2013, countries like Japan, Germany, Brazil, mm -hmm. India, Nigeria, you could, the list goes on, uh, feel that, they sh that they've achieved economic pr pre preeminence, they have kind of military strength, they have uh, economic uh, backing of, you know, from their own growth. They should be represented on a permanent basis on the Security Council. And I think that's probably the biggest issue that faces the UN in the future, mm -hmm. is to rejigger the uh, composition of, of that council, to make it more reflective of the power realities of today. Because right now, many countries feel that when the Security Council makes a decision, it's sort of inauthentic. It really doesn't represent today's world. It represents a world 68 years ago in 1945. So I think that would be the biggest challenge that the UN faces. There, of course, there are many others, expanding peacekeeping, dealing with global warming, um, working on the, develop the reduction of poverty. All these are related issues to security matters, but that to me is the key one. Mm -hmm. It's often been said recently in particular that they're almost like two UN systems. You have 20% of the budget, roughly, going to primarily the Security Council, to the General Assembly, peacekeeping, but you got the other 80% of the United Nations doing humanitarian work, 
through the UN High Commission for Refugees, the World Health Organization, UN Children's Fund, uh, just on across the board. It seems like when we cover the me when we the media cover the United Nations, 80% of the coverage is on the Security Council and maybe the General Assembly, and nothing almost on the humanitarian efforts. P case in point, right now in Syria, you've got dozens of UN agencies on the ground trying to help re over two million refugees, people who are, are fleeing for their lives in many cases trying to provide basic assistance to them, the UN World Food Program and others, but you don't read anything about it. We have a free media, but should we not maybe focus a little bit on that other 80% that we're ignoring? You know, this is one of the great surprises to me that the amount of energy and, and assets and, and money that the UN devotes to social services around this world is quite mm -hmm. remarkable. Now, it may not be terribly significant in this country, but if you go to any foreign country, you, you can realize the importance that it's placed on the United Nations organizations and agencies that service the, the, the entire planet. And yes, I think it's, it's a default and in, in, it's a problem that the United Nations cannot seem to get its story out in a way that, that amplifies the great contributions it's making to, to, to settling World, the world's problems. I, I think the, one of the things that could help a lot would be, frankly, if the United States, which as I said, is, was to crea help really create this organization, would take more responsibility for promoting it. In fact, I would be delighted if, if the president, who I know has embraced the UN as much as any president since the, it's, uh, the, the, the establishment of the UN, would talk about it a little more often. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in, under, in the Syrian situation, We've seen the Obama administration circumvent the Security Council because it won't support any action against the chemical weapons in Syria. Uh, but ho hopefully, once we get through this crisis, we can re-engage the UN and help and amplify its voice in terms of all the social services it provides the world community. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the fascinating things about your book, Act of Creation, the Founding of the United Nations. You meticulously lead us up through the historical evolution to that point in San Francisco in 1945. It's fascinating to look at the UN today, which is not the UN of 1945. It's very different to a large degree. And to make those comparisons and to see how the UN has evolved and how the role of the UN has is taken on is much more important. And the countries of the world, the international community, come to the UN to say, hey, we've got problems. We have intractable problems. We can't deal with them here. <laughs> here they are to the United Nations. Please help us. But as we look at the in 1945, the UN Charter. The Security Council was set up to deal with peace and security, but there was no mention of peacekeeping. Now, there's sort of inherent, you have to have some mechanism, and there are various <laughs> mechanisms mentioned in the Charter. But what role has peacekeeping played from when it had a very modest launching, uh, I guess, in, in, uh, to monitor the Israeli Arab situation in 1948 to where it is today with 15 peacekeeping missions, and the most recent, I guess, being in Mali, or, uh, there may have been another one started, I just missed it. But anyway, what role, how has that changed from 48 through today? It's, it's an absolutely immensely valuable role that the UN plays in peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. Do you realize if the UN didn't have troops in those 15 or so crisis spots, those mm -hmm. could spin out and become immense c conflagrations that would affect the rest of the planet in ways that we don't even imagine. So the, just the very fact that the UN exists just, just to deal with peacekeeping is a remarkable contribution to world peace and one that really doesn't get the consideration it, it deserves in this country. And in fact, we contribute, we're actually, the United States is the biggest contributor in terms of dollars to the peacekeeping effort. Even now, you know, many in Congress want to want to cut back on that. And yet, by giving those dollars to peacekeepers, we are avoiding having to send our own troops over to handle those situations. So we're actually benefiting ourselves by allowing other countries to deal with crises that otherwise would unfortunately involve our own troops mm -hmm. and our own assets. Uh, peacekeeping so is, a, is, a, is a not only valuable for the, for the world, but it becomes out, turns out to be immensely important for, for uh, saving U.S. tax dollars in this country. But it, it, it's always interesting when you talk about the fact that it's not even mentioned in the UN Charter. You know, democracy wasn't even mentioned in the UN Charter. And yet, this globe, global organization 
has become the great proponent of spreading democracy around the world. Uh, and it shows that if you read the chart, it's an immensely flexible document. It's like our own um, you know, uh, constitution. It, it, it has very broad uh, phrases that encompass all sorts of uh, thoughts that allow us to deal with crises that were never anticipated. Global warming, for example, obviously was never in the charter. And so that is one of the other strengths of the UN Charter is that it, it, it allows such uh, strength to arguments that uh, expand the knowledge and, ex and, and reach of the UN to deal with crises and ideas that would never imagine back in 1945. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is important to bring the 193 countries of the world together under one roof to deal with these problems peacefully, to bring the airlines of the world together to help draft rules to move aircraft sh safely in international airspace, to move ships safely on the high seas, to combat piracy, to move weather information. These are all vital roles that the UN plays. The UN is not a perfect organization. It certainly has problems. It can improve. Every organization can. But as you said before, or one of us said, that if the UN didn't exist today, we'd have to create it tomorrow. Steve Schlesinger, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.